please welcome the second half of our panel to the stage. Hi. So, in keeping with the last panel, would you please introduce yourselves and tell us your name, your age, and your license status? Um, I'm Annabelle Weston, I'm 17, and I don't have my license. Um, I'm Imogen Numa, I am 18, and I don't have my license. I'm Shannon Blanche, I'm 16, and I don't have my license. Thank you. Well, I have to start the first question with Imogen because today is her 18th birthday. <laughs> and so, because you're 18, that means that before the age changed, you could have actually gotten your license when you were 15, right? Yeah. So why didn't you get your license back then? To be honest, it was just pure laziness. <laughs> um, yeah, I remember on my 15th birthday, my cousin, he made a comment about, oh, you can get your license, and then mum's like, shh, don't tell her that. So I just sort of, I don't know. And also, I never really had the need to, because my parents would always take me places. But um, I live out by the airport, so it can take up to 30 minutes to get in. Mm -hmm. um, but it's also a disadvantage not having my own car because if my parents take me to town, it's half an hour there, then they'll go home. And then when I want to be picked up, it'll be another half an hour in and another half an hour back. So it's two hours of their time. But if I did have my own car, that time would be cut in half. And so would the emission. So it's a bit of a... If, if there was a bus that went out to the airport and came back, would you take that bus? Um, yeah, I probably would, but I really don't think that it's a viable solution because, you know, my closest neighbour is over a K away, so I don't really see that happening. Mm -hmm. um, I have a question for Annabelle. Um, what are your plans after you graduate, and do they include getting your licence? Um, I'm hoping to get it this year sometime, just because I'm thinking about leaving Dunedin next year and I won't have my parents to teach me to drive so it'd be easier for me to try and get as much of my learners done this year as possible yeah. but having said that I don't really have that much of a motivation to get it um, I don't actually particularly like cars and I try and just um, walk or use the bus or um, my sister she does sports and so I'll meet, my, meet up with my mum when she's picking her up and that sort of thing so I try and fit around my family a bit um, just, yeah, I don't really have much, there's not much of an appeal in driving for me. So, yeah. Um, do you have any questions yet? I was going to ask Shannon a question. Um, as a young person, Shannon, what are your thoughts on driving and how it affects the environment? Um, well, I'm not really, like, I understand that driving isn't actually that good for the environment, but it doesn't really go into details, so we're sort of aware of it, but we're not that aware of it. And I think we should probably know more information about it. Do you learn about it in school? I don't think I've ever been told about driving at school, like considering the environment. So. And for you as well? No. Do you have a um, I was just curious, Imogen, when you said that you turned 15 and your parents said, shh, yeah. <laughs> don't let her drive. Why was that? Were they not encouraging you um, to drive? Or? I think that was just mum joking. She's pretty protective of me. Like, <laughs> so for safety reasons? Uh, yeah, I would think so. Mm -hmm. but, yeah, she trusts me. She just doesn't trust other people on the roads. Yeah. And I mean, what's your experience of how safe driving is in Dunedin? Um, I don't know. There's a lot of people anyway. that drive under the influence of certain things, especially, you know, synthetic things. Um, so, I don't know, I don't really trust people. Yeah. Um, yeah, I really, that's one of the reasons I don't want to drive. Um, we get hit, you know, near misses, we've right. been hit a few times and it's just not a very nice place to drive, I don't think, at all. Mm -hmm. so. Before we started having our conversations, were you, were, this is for any of you, were you aware about the statistics in New Zealand and the high rates of, of crash for among your age group? Was that something that you were ever told about? Yeah, I think we were at some stage. I, I think we all know it's pretty high. Mm -hmm. yeah. can, I, can I ask whether any of you has the experience of riding a bike on the road to, um, to use it as transport to and from? So you're actually on the road, not BMX or mountain bike. 
Um, we had a holiday house up in Cromwell, and so when I was up there, I'd always bike. Um, but even so, my parents wouldn't let me out on the main roads. Um, but I don't bike in Dunedin. I don't think it's safe. Um, and I live up the, on the top of a hill, and it's a, just the inconvenience of having um, to take it all up the hill and where to put it. Um, I don't think that they really sort of allow for people cycling that much. What would make you cycle? Um, probably if I lived on the flat, like if I was coming to Otago Uni and I had a flat somewhere, mm -hmm. I'd probably cycle. Um, but apart from that, I don't think I'd cycle at all in Dunedin unless the, I felt really safe um, with the lanes being wider and them being consistent. Um, Shannon, you live really far from town. So um, how, how do you get into town on the weekends, um, for example? Uh, on the weekends, unless my parents are actually going into town, I'll usually catch the bus because it's, I think it's over an hour's walk. And um, they've recently put in a track on the railway, well, by the railway, by St. Leonard's, I think, because I live out near Port Chalmers. And um, it doesn't go all the way to Port Chalmers, but if it did, I would probably walk that way because otherwise I'd have to walk on the road. Mm -hmm. But if it went all the way to Port Chalmers, I probably wouldn't have a problem with walking or cycling. Walking is a town or cycling town. Okay. Yeah. What about um, your skill facilities in terms of supporting cycling? Um, if you were to go earlier to school, for example, um, would there be places to put your bikes? Would there be showers in case you wanted to get ready at school? We actually have, I think, quite a few bike racks but there never yeah. seems to be any bikes in them. <laughs> I think I've only ever seen one bike in them, yeah. like, at the most. Which school are you at? Kavanagh College as well. So really steep hills to get up there. <laughs> <Yes. laughs> okay. No street. matter what train you go. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't think it's really the best place to have a school if you want to bike. Um, Definitely not. And also, like, I th all of us, well, I mean, I don't live that far away, but none of us live really close to school. Anyway, so I don't yeah. know if I'd want to cycle all the way across town. Mm -hmm. In the last panel, uh, um, Charlotte, I'm going to use your question for them. Um, how many of you, what are your um, percentage of independent trips that you make on your own without being chauffeured or um, with, by your parents? Um, it's for all of you. Yeah. Do you mind if I start? Yes. Um, <laughs> well, I, my mum um, drives to her work, which is at Briscoe's, and then we walk from there to school mm -hmm. every morning. Um, so in that way, I guess it's sort of half independent. Mm -hmm. But um, I try and take the bus. Um, as I've gotten older, I've sort of wanted her to take me places less and less just because I can see that she's got things to do, you know. She shouldn't have to run around after me all the time. And I try and fit in with her schedule. But, like, um, like after the symposium, I was like, I'll just catch the bus home. And then she was like, no, I'll come pick you up. And I was trying to, <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to, like, be a bit more like, no, I'll be, you know, I'll be independent, but... Sometimes she'll just sort of be like, no, it's fine, I'll come pick you up no matter what you say. <laughs> so in that way, I feel there's nothing I can do about it. Um, I just sort of have to go with the flow, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for me, it's pretty much nil. Like, my parents are my only way of getting into town. But once I'm in town, I will walk wherever, like, even St. Clair or the gardens, just, yeah. Yeah, good. Um, yeah, I probably don't do that many independent trips because my parents do tend to go in twice, well not twice, they go in in the morning and then come back at night and it's usually about six o'clock so I hang around in town and then in the weekends they usually do go in as well to like to the supermarket or something so just go with them. Okay. Hank. One of the things we heard at last year's symposium from, from the, the young people and we've touched upon here as well is uh, dissatisfaction with bus service as it exists. What kind of creative ideas uh, can you come up with that would make utilizing the bus service uh, more interesting, more fun, uh, and, and more useful besides just having it free? Um, well, there's two buses around where I live and the other day I was trying to catch the bus and I went to one and I missed it and then I walked to the other one and missed that. Um, so it's, um, I didn't have the timetables and they change in the weekend. Um, so I find that really difficult. Um, and also they've got their peak times so they'll come every half hour 
at peak times and then every hour when it's not and I find that quite difficult knowing what times those are because especially in the holidays you'll be going places when it's not you know peak time like Mm -hmm. nine o'clock three o'clock um so in that way I find it quite difficult to catch the bus I think just timetables um being available I think there's an, maybe an app for them. I'm not actually 100% sure on that. You mean like, um, let me just ask you this, like a timetable like in Wellington where it has like um, on uh, electronic timetables, yeah. something like I'm that? I'm not sure if we have them. We do not have them. Uh, would that be helpful? That would be. Um, also online, because you have to download PDFs. If they just had it, <laughs> <It's true. laughs> you don't have to download it, it would be a bit easier. So you can just click on it and have a quick look and then run out the door. Yeah, I've caught the bus probably four times in my entire life and like those experiences were not very nice so I think then the bus service needs to be made a bit more enticing like um just the whole concept to me is a bit cringeworthy like walking on it's not very like clean and the people on there aren't very savory and just kind of like you know so I think um sort of maybe renovating them a bit more if that's possible would definitely open it up to different people. I think perhaps making them more sort of frequent during busier times because I occasionally catch the bus after school and at the 315 one there are a lot of school students going in and it gets really crowded but there's also like older people as well catching it and then if you miss that one you have to wait till I think 4.30 to catch the next one so it's really just quite inconvenient and you don't really want to be crowded in on the bus because it's quite difficult to get out and stuff so... (coughs) I'm curious, um, uh, as we talked about with this panel, um, how environmental thinking influences any of your decisions or if you've come across um, anything that's made you think differently or...? Um, Well, I just, like, when I get to town, I just try and walk when I can. Mm -hmm. Um, It's sort of, I guess, a bit of a combination of, um, like, thinking about the environment but not all the time. I'm not like, I must walk to save the trees sort of, or anything like that. I'm just sort of like, well, I'll walk because, you know, it's no emissions, it's just, you know, and it's exercise. Mm-hmm. Um, but I just, I don't think that there's probably enough out there. Unless mm-hmm. you have a real interest in it, I don't think that you get any information mm-hmm. really on it. Mm-hmm. And I think a lot of people just think, oh, like, other people do it. They don't really think that, like, them doing it will benefit, they just rely on the rest of the population. Mm-hmm. That's a good point. Yeah. Um, the other um, panel, the first half of the panel alluded to, you know, what thinking about their opinions and whether or not they matter. Do you guys feel like your opinions matter? I think teenagers get quite a bad sort of rep. Like, I don't know, there seems to be sort of a stereotype that we're not very polite or anything, which isn't really the case. And so older people are sort of more wary about us, which isn't really necessary. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I definitely, my opinions are important. <laughs> that, yeah, it um, is, it's definitely yeah, important. Yeah, I think, I think adults, they're more set in their ways, and I think that it's important to listen to younger people that are still developing routines. That, yeah. Yes. Mm. Yeah, I I agree with all that. Um, it's like if I have an opinion, I mean, in theory, I could post it online, but who's actually going to read it? You know, there's, there's just because it's up there doesn't mean anyone's actually going to see it. So I think that we need to have more information about where we can take our opinions, mm-hmm. and that sort of thing. Can anyone in the audience speak to that point? Where can they take their opinions? There's a Dunedin City Council has the Youth Action Council, which is um, youngsters. I think they had Otago girls on it at one point, but um, it would really be worth contacting Michael Laufiso <coughs> at the council and saying, I want to be on the Youth Action Committee. I'll get that name to you. Yeah. <laughs> See, we've never like been told about that. No. I've never actually heard of that, so I wouldn't know to go there. Isn't, I haven't heard about it in school or anything mm-hmm. like that, so. Or even, and it's scary as it sounds, going along to um, hearings on annual plans. Um, the DCC every year 
um, makes a plan about what, what it's doing for the year and calls for submissions on that. And um, I know from experience, from going along with a group organisation that I'm part of that represents young people, that they're really receptive of hearing young people and they actually like knowing what young people want in the city. So that's like another avenue that you can go through if you don't want to join a committee but still want your voice heard. Yeah. So I just, I, sorry, I just think an important Please. point is we get most of our information through school okay. and so it really needs to go to the schools for us to mm -hmm. sort of hear about it because it's not that we're closed-minded but that's where we're at at the moment. Um, so mm -hmm. I think that's, people often forget that and then they, you might stumble across something accidentally on the internet but most of our information does come through the schools. So. Important point. Can I make a point also, um, in my experience, I think it's quite valuable not to just go through youth channels. Um, and I was on youth councils um, and maybe it was just at the time or how they were, those particular ones were run, um, but I didn't find that as engaging as perhaps going to a public meeting or getting involved in channels that are mostly dominated by adults. Um, and often I found those kind of groups were kind of patronizing in ways and I think it's important to remember that your opinions are valued not just because you're young people but because you're actually also members of the community and you're just as valuable as anyone else so yeah that's, that's a, a good segue into this question which flips things around a little bit because we've been talking about uh, what you can do and what society can do to help you make better choices but you're a member of society, and you've heard from some international experts today all the, the good things, the economic goods and the environmental goods and the societal goods, if everybody would make better choices in their transportation modes. Mm -hmm. So my question is, what do you think you can do to change your parents' attitudes and the older people's attitudes uh, amongst your teachers and, and other adults in your community? Mm, it's kind of a hard one because my dad, he bikes to work, but my mum really just uses the car all the time. Um, I don't know if she's ever actually caught a bus. <laughs> oh, that sounds a bit mean. But I, I've, ne I've never caught a bus with her. So that's um, you yeah, but I just, I don't know how, because she's so reliant on the car, I don't know how I'd quite go about that. I'm trying to... Maybe next Mother's Day you could say, let's go out for a Mother's Day trip together on the bus and go have lunch. <laughs> Just a suggestion. <laughs> um, it's quite funny actually because she's really into getting us kids to use, like walk and use the bus, mm -hmm. but her, she won't herself. Mm. Um, so I'm, I would like to do that, try and get her to use it, but I just don't know how to go about it really. Yeah. Uh, I know my dad encourages, encourages us to walk places and things. And since they put the, um, I think it's the plaza in by the stadium, we've made several trips um, we drive up to St Leonard's where the track starts and then walk the rest of the way there and have brunch or whatever. Oh. And so they kind of encourage us to not rely so much on cars and buses and things if we can. Yeah, I think my parents would be um, a lot more open to biking and walking and stuff if we actually had the opportunity, but like living so far away, there isn't. So, yeah. We do that far away, that's for sure. Oh, yes. I just wondered if we could ask you each to comment on the, um, the ideas in the very first presentation of the keynote where we were looking at a um, motorized trans transport system and then a multimodal system. And I wondered if, you, if that, um, inspired, just that change of terminology inspired you to think about tri uh, cho choosing to do trips differently. Um, because it opened up more options, you know, multimodal does m allow choices. So, what's use the bus is useful for some people, but a bike is useful for others. And mothers transport kids and handbags and groceries in their cars. And so, you know, there could be a little more definition around multimodal if we we're looking into need. You know, these are the options. Did that give you any more inspiration? The two, the contrast of the two different systems. Uh, well. I think the multimodal one, when changing the roads and things to make it more accessible for cycling, I think that was probably sort of the strongest point that I got from that because I know my parents would encourage cycling, but there really isn't an opportunity because I don't feel I'm safe cycling. <coughs> but um, yeah, if, if it did become more accessible, then I think, I know I'm quite inspired to start 
using different modes of transport. Um, I really like that plan. I'd love to live in a city like that. Um, I don't think, um, I think Dunedin's pretty good because most of the stuff is really in the centre. Um, but then you've got things like the Ega Centre, which is so far out. It's just, um, it's kind of extreme. But I, I would love to have like little like trees and islands everywhere and <laughs> big cycleways. Um, I don't, yeah, I don't like the amount of traffic we have on the roads, um, especially down George Street because you've got so many people jaywalking and then just so many people driving down there all the time and it's um I would really like to live in a city like that yeah I agree with him I think it would be um having different modes of transport would be a lot more peaceful and less hectic with all the cars and just everyone would just feel a lot more relaxed yeah that's good good comments possibly less road rage as well yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So why haven't, I don't think I've asked the panel this, this one, why haven't you three gotten your license yet? Mm. Is it open to all of you? Would you like to start, Shannon? Um, well, I'm actually just waiting till my next pay to actually book my license, the theory one, because my parents want me to pay for it myself. But I sort of, I see it sort of in, as an independence thing, because there's not very, the bus route isn't that good out by my house. So if I had a car, I would quite like to be able to you know, go in whenever I wanted. I wouldn't always use it, but I'd like to be able to have the option to be able to drive. And also my brother, older brother, hasn't actually got his license yet, so that's sort of incentive. To and how old is he? He's turning 20 in January, so. He doesn't have his license. Yeah, but he has buses coming outside his house every 15 minutes, so. Imogen, why haven't you even gotten your license yet? Um. Yeah, just I think you've done me a bit. Oh, that's just right. sorry, laziness. But <laughs> I do plan on getting it soon because it's my dad's last year of work next year, so I'll go flashing. Mm -hmm. And I don't think I'll necessarily use it, but I think just to have it and then it's just reassuring. Yeah. Why don't you have your Um, I don't have mine just because it's sort of been pushed to the back. Like I've been focusing more on like schoolwork and stuff, and it's easy to be like oh but you know this is important this is what I'm doing now um, and also I yeah I, mean, I can get around with that getting a license um, I know that if I use the buses probably better I would be completely unreliant on my parents but then again my mum still sometimes likes <laughs> to pick me up um, but um, it's not really something I'm seeing as a really important thing but I would get it I'm going to try and get it this year um, just because I, my parents can teach me and I won't have that if I'm away next year somewhere else. That's right. So. You might go to Wellington. Did you have a question? Do you want to interject? No, I'm okay. Very good? Okay. How about the, other, the first half of the panel? Do you have any questions for the second half of the panel? Or vice versa? Um, I thought I'd introduce the idea. Yeah. I just remember we had students since driving driving uh, that, um, what was it saying again? Um, students Against Driving Drunk, uh -huh. SADD. Um, and we went out to the Edgar Centre and they showed you the results of a car crash and they had a mock funeral. Um, but I think that raised awareness on the single day and then there was no follow-up. Mm -hmm. So we were affected on that day, but beyond that, it kind of faded to the back of our minds. It's also quite intimidating, that, the whole drunk driving thing, because the stats seem to be quite high. So it sort of puts us off getting licenses because we're like, what if it did happen? There's people like that on the roads. We don't want to be caught in a situation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what would a campaign like that, how would that be improved, do you think, if instead of just a one day, you know? I think maybe transferring a bit more of the responsibility onto us. It felt to me it was a large shock factor and it was more like maybe your irresponsibility can't be controlled by by you. I don't know that maybe it's just an inherent part of being a teenager, you're going to be irresponsible. But I felt like if they acknowledged that we could control ourselves um, and if we were given a bit more responsibility, I think that would be quite good. Todd, you had a question? Oh, sorry, Todd, yes. Yeah, um, if I understand the situation correctly, all of you <clears throat> are live in houses that are more or less automobile dependent, that your, 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 your parents' choice of where to buy a house significantly affects your ability to, or significantly affects your dependency on automobiles. Is that true? So, we won't tell them, <laughs> but do you think your parents made the right decision? Or put differently, 
when you have, let's say, when you're raising children, and your children are, say, 10 years old, and you're shopping for a house, do you think it'll be more important that you will want to choose a house that's closer to town on, say, a bike route or a bus route or within walking distance of, a convenient walking distance of schools, would that be more important to you, having experienced this, than you think your parents, than your parents thought about? Um, that's difficult. Um, I actually don't think that I would ever change, like, not living up, growing up in the country. Um, and I actually find it hard to see myself living in town. Um, I enjoy the whole sort of, like, out of it all. And I don't really mind driving in all the time because, yeah, I don't know how it would affect my decisions <coughs> with my children. Mm. Um, just a lot of the houses that are, or well, quite a few of them that are close to town are more expensive. So the cost factor is a huge thing. When we bought our house, um, there wasn't a lot of houses on the market. Um, so we kind of, well, we bought it, but it wasn't like our first choice. We needed a house, and so we brought it. Um, it wasn't like they put a ton of thought into exactly where it was. It was in a good, safer area, um, and that was, um, and it was a house with four bedrooms. That was sort of the deciding factor, and we could afford it. So I think that's a huge part of it. Well, I do like living quite outside of town. Well, not quite outside of town, but a bit out of town. But I do understand that sort of growing up as a child, I didn't really like the fact that I lived so far out because I couldn't go to friends' houses as often. Mm -hmm. And it was very isolated. And there weren't very many people my age around. So I didn't... If I had children, I'd want to move closer. But I wouldn't want to be sort of in town, maybe like one of the closest suburbs or something. Yeah. One of the deciding factors of my parents buying houses in less than you so oh. we're always going to be on a hill. Is that <laughs> so, yeah. And I like the idea of being slightly removed from the centre city mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. It feels safer. Also, high density, high crime, right? That's right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have thoughts on that? Um, I think that um, one of the last things um, people think about when buying a house, unless it's an extreme distance away from um, the main sort of central set, um, hub, um, they're not really thinking about transport, they're thinking about is this going to be high maintenance? Um, can we afford it? Is it um, going to be suitable? Is this area suitable for our kids to grow up in? So I think transport and the modes of transport to actually get to the house, to the city, I think that's one of the sort of mm -hmm. least priorities when buying a house. Do you think that it should be uh, um, maybe considered when buying a house? It should be considered, but I mean, if you're going to live um, in a place like um, I don't want to know. I think here or Cavendishon, mm -hmm. yeah. um, where the housing is generally not as good as a place like Roslyn, but it is it has got a better system to get into town. Um, but the housing there is not as good. Then you have to sort of weigh up well, mm -hmm. is the house going to be drafty or is it going to be warm? Are my kids going to get sick or are they going to mm -hmm. be healthy? I lived in Q and Roslyn. You lived in both Q yeah. and Roslyn? Yeah. And Q was. Q was good enough. Yeah, it was good. It was good in order to get to school and things yeah. like that. Yeah. Um, and Roslyn's good. Roslyn's quite good for it's quite calm, so you can cycle and walk yeah. around. Yeah. But I think transport is one of the sort of lesser priorities as to actual the structural integrity of the house that you're buying yeah. into where it is. Mm. We're getting to the end of. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I, say, I wouldn't want to live right in the middle of town. I think that would be really unpleasant. Mm -hmm. But. Um, I also think if I was a parent, I would actually be worried about sending my children out walking to school, even if I did live quite close to the school, or sending them on a bus when they're young. And I think taking them to sports practice, I wouldn't just send them off by themselves. I'd want to drive them there and back. What about walking them there and back? Oh, yeah. <laughs> if I got, I'm sorry, just an honest <laughs> suggestion. Um, if I was going off to work, though, early, yeah. how would I do that? Those are good questions, yeah. yeah. Any other questions for this half of the panel, or did you guys have anything to say that we didn't talk about? <laughs> well, thank you very much. A round of applause for our second panel, please.
this point, I'd like to um, invite the rest of the panel to come and join their group. So everyone's on the stage. And um, as soon as that gets taken care of, um, Hank is going to have, Professor Hank Weiss is going to come back up and do some final, um, uh, come, around, come around this way, um, some final, um, final questions and wrap up for the day. So yeah. They, uh, let's give everyone one last big round of applause. They did great. Thank you so much. <laughs> I want to say thank you. Um, you know, young or old, we're all in this together. You're going to be at it probably for a little longer time, demographics being what it is. But I want to remind people that we're all one community, and, and we all want to work on the problems that will make Dunedin and the other communities that we decide to live in uh, a more livable place uh, and a more enjoyable place and one in which we do think not just about us but about the people that will follow. So people that are online, uh, thank you for joining oh, us today. Uh, are there any other questions for the, the, the young people up here or any of, of the other speakers that we had today? Brittany, Todd. Uh, we only had uh, one question via Twitter. And she left. And, and our speaker um, left, I think. Yeah. Uh, we, she, had, she had to leave. So uh, we won't be able to direct that to Sophia. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Just um, reflecting on your what's happening in your lives now, do you think your lives are built around car dependency? Um, me personally, I'd say yes. Um, I don't think I'd play. I don't think I'd be able to go to anywhere near as many sports practices as what I do. Um, yeah, if I don't have a car, because some practices um, are about seven o'clock in the morning at, at school for basketball. So if I didn't have a car, I yeah, definitely wouldn't be able to go to those. Um, if my parents couldn't drive me places, I think my social life would be quite decreased. Um, and also sports practices and things like that, we have to drive quite a long way to get to where I do archery. Um, and if I didn't have a car, I don't think I could go to practices because they're in the morning and in the afternoon and it changes. So. Yeah, I actually, um, I used to do netball and karate, so basically every single night I would have something on and it might be at, say, 7 or 8 o'clock and it just wasn't realistic for me to go home then go in, so I ended up getting, like, giving them up. Um, I wouldn't say I am so much, um, just because if there's things after school, I'll just stay in town and then I'll bus home and I'll just text my mum and be like, I'm not being picked up. So in that way, I think it's pretty good. Um, I could, I guess I could bust everywhere I really need to go. Um, but it does help when like there's an emergency or if something comes up and you don't have a lot of time to get somewhere if you miss the bus to be able to get a ride, so. Um, I think I depend on being driven around places to a degree, but um, getting to and from school isn't really too much of a problem. I can just use the bus. I can actually just walk up to the place where I have soccer <coughs> practice, and so I do that. But um, it becomes a problem if I need to, um, when I'm going to soccer games, because the parks are in awkward places um, that you can't catch a bus to. And um, other than that, going to friends' houses. But yeah. Yeah, I could probably survive without cars, but I think it would just be the hassle of getting to friends' houses and I suppose the occasional sports practice, if it's out of the way, it would be quite difficult. So. Questions for Todd or anything? All right. Well, we'll wrap things up. Uh, we've got some other things to do locally here in Dunedin, with lunch probably being the most important thing, followed <laughs> by a, a walkthrough again to the international audience. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks to all the speakers uh, and uh, the, the new facts and the new challenges that they've gotten uh, across to us. And hopefully, we'll be able to do this again soon. So, thank you, Kiara. And good afternoon, everybody. Thank you.